Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Let's get started with lecture two of efficientml.ai. Um, so in the last lecture, we introduced a lot of the exciting problems that modern AI can solve, including large language models generated by AI, autonomous driving, and a lot of other cool techniques. And we demonstrated how much computing, how much memory do we need in order to achieve those awesome applications, which motivated us to learn um, how do we compress those models, how do we do uh, efficient AI computing to make them more efficient. So during last lecture, uh, many of you asked me about what is the prerequisite. So let me uh, illustrate that again. So the prerequisite is supposed to be a advanced course at grad level or upper uh, undergrad level. So uh, students should be have the background of machine learning course uh, 6036 or equivalent, and also the computer architecture knowledge uh, such as uh, 6.191 uh, or 6.04. So uh, we are uh, we suppose we have deep knowledge about C and C++ programming since the last lab assignment will be done in C and C++. Um, and also you should be familiar with uh, computer architecture and systems knowledge like page table, cache locality, uh, those kind of concepts as well as, uh, as deep learning concepts uh, like back propagation, activation and function, uh, what is so classic with the descent. So uh, those are the prerequisites. And we use uh, efficient ML.ai, which is our main course website to announce um, the homeworks, uh, the assignments, and also the lecture slides. Uh, so if you go to efficient ML.ai now, uh, you should be able to see the lecture slides of this lecture is already posted. Uh, we also posted lab zero, uh, which is introduction to PyTorch to give you a, a warm up. Uh, it will not be graded, uh, but it will be uh, help yourself get familiarized with the uh, homework submission procedure. So um, uh, TA will uh, make it a post that you're supposed to submit lab zero after you complete it. It's not graded, but familiar with yourself, familiarize yourself with the process how to submit homeworks through Canvas, okay? So uh, Canvas is the only place that we use in this course when you need to submit the homework. And all the other course materials are openly uh, publicly available at efficientml.ai. And discussions will be in this course, okay? Um, all right, with that, let's get started with efficientml.ai lecture two, uh, which is basics of neural networks. So as deep learning continues to scale, uh, this is the speed of the demand of computing. It is growing uh, exponentially super fast in recent years. Uh, so I suppose the, uh, the supply of computing with the strong uh, the green line, uh, illustrating the uh, GPU memory available in the past couple of years, where uh, Moore's law is doubling the transistor every two years, but those deep learning models are growing more than four X for every two years, right? So uh, clearly uh, we need uh, techniques like model compression and efficient AI computing techniques to bridge the gap between the supply of computing and the demand of computation. So pretty exciting uh, just today, if you go to MIT homepage, uh, MIT.com actually highlighted our research on efficient VIT from our TA Han Tai. So uh, efficient VIT basically can speed up those high resolution um, AI computing, where we will need a high resolution dense pixel prediction. Uh, the amount of memory and also the amount of computation required is pretty big. So Han designed a new AI model to speed up high resolution computation, which can improve the inequality uh, for ADAS, uh, how much driving many um, mobile applications. So in this lecture, we'll learn what are the metrics, what are the latency, what is the flaws, what is the model size, and how do we uh, analytically analyze what is supposed to be fast, what is slow, okay? So like uh, efficient VIT can run 21 frames per second compared with baseline, only 1.6 frames per second, right? Enable this kind of real time uh, street scene uh, segmentation running on the edge. So this is running not on the desktop GPU, this is running on a edge GPU, okay? NVIDIA Jetson AGX Ori, uh, which is roughly this big, the, the size of your palm is big. 
Okay. And here we have seen some examples in the last lecture as well. Uh, this is Sam, uh, the segment anything from Facebook. Uh, for example, a triangle segment, give a, uh, give a point, which is uh, the prompt. And in the segment, the foreground, this is the dog. Uh, we fully maintain the accuracy while uh, accelerating the speed difference from 12 images per second to 840 images per second. So these are some of the main motivation, what we can learn uh, and why do we need such acceleration techniques. Uh, similarly, in this case, uh, Thomas driving scenario segment in the road, uh, which I feel is even better than the uh, baseline segmentation using the VIT huge. Okay, we'll introduce VIT vision transformers in the uh, second section of this lecture. Okay, the first section will be inference, efficient inference techniques that is general, including pruning, quantization, neural architecture search, and also model distillation. In the second part, in the second section of this semester, we are going to introduce those application specific uh, inference optimization techniques, uh, specifically uh, the large language model. We are going to spend two lectures on large language model. ChatGPT is super popular these days, so we are spending very heavily on large language model. And also uh, one lecture on vision transformers. So transformers not only revolutionizing uh, the NLP and natural language processing, but also vision. Okay, lots of the vision tasks previously we were using CNN architectures, actually we'll talk about that in this lecture, are actually being transformed uh, by using transformers. So BITs are uh, very important. We'll also cover um, AIGC, how to accelerate diffusion models uh, like stable diffusion. Uh, if you have used mid journey, those are our topics as well. And also we'll talk about uh, point cloud video and also GAN acceleration. So those are the second part, which is the domain specific, application specific accelerations. So in the third part, we'll talk about training techniques, okay? How do we scale up uh, distributed training to train those super big models like 175 billion parameter uh, GPT-3 model? Okay, how do we distribute the weight, um, model parallelism, data parallelism, uh, pipeline parallelism, et cetera? Um, so that's roughly give you an overview about this course, okay? So with that, let's jump into today's lecture, okay? So first of all, we'll review the terminology of neural networks. So forget about the advanced stuff. We want to start with something very basic, very simple, to give you a very solid foundation. Okay? And then we are going to uh, review uh, those popular building blocks in a neural network, like fully connected layers, convolution layers, group count, that's what's count. Okay? Uh, following that, we'll talk about different uh, activation functions, and also pooling layers, different normalization layers, and a little bit about transformers. The bulk of the transformer will be introduced uh, in the large language model section. And then we are going to review uh, popular CN architectures followed by popular efficiency metrics. So this, this part will be super important. Okay? You have heard uh, many times about several T-ops per second, several G-ops per second, G-flops per second. What, what is the difference? T, G, flops, ops per second, big, big letter S, small letter S. So we'll introduce in detail about these metrics, what is the MAC, et cetera. And what is the latency? What is the throughput? What's the relationship between latency and throughput, et cetera. Okay. And in the end, uh, if we have time, we'll uh, like our TA to give a short, short tutorial about PyTorch and also lab exercises. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, first of all, any questions about overall plan schedule? So far, so good. All right. So let's first talk about a uh, neuron synapse. So this is a biological analogy, uh, the synapses, which corresponds to the weight uh, between uh, the synaptic terminals. Okay, and the axon is similar to the output uh, activation function where you get a several input axons and you uh, multiply with the weight, which is a uh, synapse, and you sum up all the um, signals together. If it is uh, above a threshold, then it's going to fire through this activation function. If it is smaller than that, then that is not going to fire. 
So we have um, an example here, a three layer neural network with uh, two hidden layers. Okay? This is layer zero, layer one, and layer two. Okay? So in each layer, uh, we're going to introduce the terminologies. These are the same. Okay? Synapses also means the weight. Okay? If you say a parameter model has 175 billion parameter, 175 billion parameters, that means you have 175 billion uh, weights or synapses, they're the same thing. Okay? Uh, the other is the uh, activations. It's also called neurons or features or activations. So we'll, uh, we'll use these terminologies interchangeably uh, in, this, uh, in this lecture. We we'll also talk, sometimes talk about the width of a model. Okay? When we talk a model is very wide, it means which dimension? Like this dimension, okay? the hidden uh, dimension. Uh, the size of the hidden dimensions determines the width of a model. Okay? And sometimes we, we call going deeper, a uh, deep neural network. Which dimension is the depth dimension? Right, so this is the depth dimension. If we say a model is deeper, it really means it has many layers. So given the same number of parameters, the same number of computing, uh, just a quick question brings down a wide and shallow neural network versus a narrow but uh, deep neural network, which is more likely to run faster on the GPU. Wide and shallow. Right, wide and shallow. So we'll, we'll learn about that in a later in the lecture where a wide and shallow model, you already have less number of uh, kernel calls. Each layer you know, uh, usually corresponds to one kernel call. Of course, you can fuse them. Those are some of the advanced techniques. But more kernel calls means there's more uh, overhead. Okay? And GPU utilization, if the matrix is super small, like only three by four, it's very likely to get underutilized. So a wider model and shallower model are usually faster uh, to run on the GPU. However, there's no free lunch, right? In order to train a model, make it easy to converge with good accuracy, you need, you need a deep model, okay? So that's the um, uh, something you need to trade off. And that's what makes this architecture design very exciting, right? You have to balance uh, the high accuracy, easy to train, easy to converge, but also on the hardware side, we wanna make it hardware friendly, high utilization and make it fast. So I should introduce some of the popular neural network layers, okay, starting with the most basic uh, linear layer. Okay. So the linear is very simple. The linear has several inputs and several outputs. In this example, we have four, five input nodes and also three output nodes. Okay, so this layer, what it does is basically using the weight to combine uh, to do a linear transformation for the input plus the bias. Okay, in this case. We have a one by five input tensor, and the weight is five by three. Okay, so one by five times five by three, you get one by three output. Okay, so um, the shape of the tensor is denoted by one by CI, CI for uh, input, okay, input channel, okay, C for channel. And then the output feature is one by CO, O for output. So this is the dimension for the output channel. Uh, we still also have the weight, which is CO comma CI, okay, which projects from C input to the output channel. Okay, so finally, we have a bias. So the bias dimension is the same as the, the, this dimension of the weight. Okay? So that's a very simple uh, linear layer. So what if we have more than one uh, input. So we have another dimension, which is the batch dimension. Okay. So compared with the previous slide, now we have spin dimension, where we have uh, more than one input. Okay. So we introduce this batch size as the um, another dimension. So the input feature now is n by ci. Okay. Output feature becomes n by co. That's the dimension of the weight change. It doesn't change, right? No matter how many inputs you have, the dimension of the weight is the same, and the bias is also the same. So these are input agnostic. These are the models, models, the weights of the model. 
All right, so let's look at the convolution layer. So previously, uh, each output is connected to all the inputs. So what if uh, we have a very big input uh, feature map and usually the output is only related to a specific a subset of the input. Okay? For example, in this case, we have a one dimensional input. So this is the uh, channel dimension. And also we have this spatial dimension, okay? spatial dimension, um, which is item one, item two, three, four, five. Okay. So what is the common uh, one dimensional um, um, input? What is the common application for that? For example, speech is a common one dimension signal. Okay, it is a one dimensional. And within that, you may have uh, a, a dense feature map. Okay? So looking at this picture, it looks like a two dimensional feature map, right? Because you have two dimensions. But actually, uh, this is the channel dimension okay? in embedding the features like T1, T2, T3, T4, or position one, two, or three, four. And each position, you have a one dimensional uh, vector to represent the feature for that particular time step. Okay? That's why we are saying this is actually one dimensional signal, but actually uh, the tensor is two dimensional. Okay? One of the dimension is the the channel. Okay, imagine for image, you have RGB, they have three channels, right? So for speech, you may have, you may also have different uh, features like the, uh, the volume, the pitch, etc. cetera. Okay? That's why uh, we wanna distinguish that. So here, each output depends on three of the input spatial dimension. Okay? And we can have another filter another filter, the yellow filter, to produce another output. Okay. When we have more um, three channels, then we have three output channels. Okay. And then we can shift the uh, input by one. And as a result, we can generate the output shifted by one as well. And using this scenario, we can generate a uh, longer time sequence. Okay. So let's see the dimension here. The input feature is n, n is the batch dimension, and then ci is the input channel dimension, um, and also uh, the wi, okay, which is the the window size of the one call, uh, or the width of the input in this in this uh, in this example we have one, two, three, four, five. Uh, okay, wi equal to five. And then for the output, very similarly, we have output channel and output width. So we also have the kernel size um, of this window, which is three in this case, and also the CO and CI. Okay, CI corresponds to the input, CO corresponds to the output. So um, now we can expand it from 1D convolution into a 2D convolution. Uh, just like I mentioned before, this is 2D convolution, but the tensor is actually a how many dimensions? Three dimensions, okay? Because one of the dimension is the channel dimension, like RGB in the first layer, okay? And then you have the X, you have the Y, like if I have an image of um, uh, 1024 by 768, this is the uh, height and width. Dimension. Okay. So for the 2D curve, we have the height and width dimension for the input, for the output, and this is for the channel. Okay, and this is for the batch. So that's why it's super important. Whenever you learn a new layer, it's crucial to understand the dimension. Okay. Okay. So uh, we have one filter, one filter with kernel size kW by kH. Okay. And then we are going to convolve that with the input tensor. One filter, filter produces one single output. And you have another filter produces another output channel. Now you have three filters, you have three output channels. And now we can move the input by, by one. And then we can get the second element 
shifted by one as well. Following that, we shifted by another time uh, versus to the bottom, shift by right, shift by right, another um, go by uh, go down a little bit, shift by right, shift by right. That completes the uh, three by three convolution on this input tensor that is five by five, and we produce the output tensor that is three by three. Okay, and now you have three such uh, filters. Therefore, we have three output channels in this case. So how many um, dimensions do we have for 2D convolution? A little more complicated, right? So uh, we have the batch, same as before, an input channel, which is the input channel dimension, and also the output channel dimension, okay? Um, we also have the height of the input and the output, the width, height and width of the input, height and width of the output, okay? And finally, we have the kernel height and kernel width. So this is the uh, kernel height and kernel width. Okay. So let's see why the input is five by five. How about the output? It's actually three by three. We, we lose two pixels. What happened here? And what is the general relationship between the output height and the input height, the output width and also the input width. For example, we have a three by three convolution kernel. How many times it can shift? If you start with here, I only shift by one, by another one, I only shift by two, two times. And that's why you get a, a three output element. So this is the general equation. Um, how do we calculate um, the height of the output versus the input and the kernel size. And okay? so you always have the output equal to the height of the input minus the kernel size plus one. Okay? Plus, because you can only move um, the time. Uh, the time you move is actually limiting uh, the limiting factor why the output size is smaller than the input. For example. Here, uh, we have the input width. Uh, if the input width is equal to four, kernel size is equal to three, you can easily calculate what is the output dimension. Okay? So it's four minus three plus one, yeah? it's actually two minus two. That's why the uh, feature map becomes smaller uh, when you have a four by four input, but the output is only two by two if you have a three by three convolution. So in order to maintain the feature map, uh, we introduce padding so that rather than the output becomes smaller than the input, we want to maintain the size um, of the output to be the same as the input. So we can pad um, the input, okay, and not the output. So one technique is using uh, the zero padding. Outside, we can pad a lot of zeros. Other than that, we can also do reflection padding. For example, you have one, five, nine here, you reflect it one by one, five, nine, one, four, seven, you have one, four, seven the other way, okay? Uh, you can also do replication padding. So for example, this one, you just replicate the closest one that has an actual number. So actually zero padding is very widely used uh, in practice, just pad, the input boundaries with zero, which is the default uh, in PyTorch. And now we want to talk about the receptive field. Okay? In order to understand the image, uh, we, we have to, you really have to um, see a global wheel or a, a larger patch of the, of the input um, in order to understand the relationship. Okay? For example, in order to understand what I'm doing, you can not only uh, see a part of my body, but the whole body to understand what action is actually I'm actually doing, right? So uh, how do we calculate the receptive field? Okay, that matters uh, when we are talking about the MCU net um, to um, shrink the, um, um, the activation size 
and also do patch based inference. So this is a very important concept. In a three by three convolution, one output is dependent on a uh, three by three input window. Okay, and further, this uh, element of this layer depends on this entire three by three window. So from this very first layer to the third layer, how many pixels in this picture map uh, will impact this single pixel? How many pixels? How many pixels here will influence this output pixel? Five. Right, five, right? And up here, you have three, three by three, but each of them depends on another uh, three by three. So altogether, it, it is impacted by five by five. So here, naturally top top tail is seven by seven, right? So in general, the deeper you go, the more, the larger receptive field you're gonna get. And the relationship is always kernel size minus one, okay? Kernel size minus one times the depth, number of layers, and also plus one. You can easily do the math. Is there any rule of thumb saying like, a certain percentage of the image size or is it that the images but, uh, have a receptive field that takes the percentage of the original image, or like I would imagine maybe it's some empirical data would show, hey, if the pixel has a receptive field that covers the full image, maybe that gets uh, too noisy and bad. And there's a sweet spot somewhere. Oh, so for the image, the question is how, how much the receptive field should be, right? So uh, on image that a very canonical way is input is 224 by 224, and output is seven by seven. So in that way, you can do classification, but that's not always the case because you can have different corner cases. Right? Sometimes you have a, like uh, A is chasing after B, but A is exactly on the top left the corner, B is on the top uh, bottom right corner. So you have to see both in order to understand the relationship. So it's always good, uh, depends on the task. It's usually good to have a larger perceptive field. So let's see, um, in this example, in order to enlarge the receptive field, we either have to increase the number of layers, but like we mentioned in the early part of this lecture, that makes it slower, or we can use a large kernel size, okay? But large kernel size means more weight. In three by three, you have nine weights. Seven by seven, you have 49 weights, okay? So is there other way we can enlarge the receptive field but does not incur a huge amount of computing. Okay, so the method is actually down sample. We can down sample the feature map. Okay. Um, so let's see an example where uh, we are performing uh, down sample to achieve the same uh, receptive field, which is seven, compared with the bottom case where. Uh, in order to impact this pixel, uh, three by three is a receptive field here, five by five is here, seven by seven is here. So we all actually need three consecutive layers to achieve uh, the seven by seven and receptive field. However, uh, we can downsample the feature map using a stride of two. And so uh, this is an eight by eight feature map. We downsample it, it becomes four, uh, it becomes the resolution is cut by half. Okay? So although here, um, this pixel impacted by uh, this three by three region, and since we have a stride of two, okay, so um, more pixels will impact the same will impact the same pixel. Okay? For example, uh, this pixel will be impacted by here. This pixel will be impacted by here. Okay? So um, down sample will be a very effective way. Um, to uh, increase the receptive field. And in another way, uh, with a slide larger than one, the output uh, dimension, x, y dimension will be smaller, will be divide, divided by the stride. Since every x, s pixels, s is a stride, uh, will be merged into only one pixel, uh, either by a max or a sum. Okay, so um, let's now talk about the uh, grouped convolution. Okay. 
Okay, so previously, all the output will depend on all the inputs. Okay, so in order to save computing, uh, we can uh, shard it by hand. Okay? So these output channels only depends on these input channels. They are not related at all to the second part of the input. Okay, so in this example, we have two groups. Uh, so by doing that, the input feature and output feature map are exactly the same, but the weight will be um, smaller. So we have two groups, so G equal to two, and for each group, um, the input channel and output channel are all cut by half. Okay? So altogether, how many, uh, what's the ratio uh, reduction of the number of weights if we have a group size of G? So it's reduced by G, right? If you multiply them together, um, we have G times less number of parameters. So for example, here, uh, previously we have, uh, this is eight, this is eight, and altogether this is 16. So previously uh, we have 16 by 16, that's 256 uh, parameters. And now we have eight by eight, this is 64. And we have two of them, that's altogether 128. And so that's, 128 is only half of 256, which is the original number of parameters. So group convolution is an effective way to reduce the number of weights. So what is the extreme? So the extreme is rather than having only two groups, we can have as many of groups as the number of input channels. Okay, so suppose we have eight input channels and also eight output channels. Each output channel now is only dependent on only one input channel. Okay. So the number of groups now equal to the number of input channels and output channels. Okay. So the, the size of the weight becomes rather than CO, CI times HW is just CHW. Okay, because um because G, which is the number of group, now equal to the number of channels. Okay? And the size of the feature map doesn't change. So this is the foundation of the uh, mobile net family, which we are going to introduce. Unfortunately, this is not quite an efficient design where you reduce the number of weights. Okay? So the weight efficiency, the number of parameters is drastically reduced, but the, well, the flops is also drastically reduced, but I'm going to introduce later. But activation size didn't change at all. Contrary, in order to compensate for the loss of capacity by reducing the, uh, the number of weights, people have to use a pretty large expansion ratio in mobile IV2. Um, so actually, the activation size, number of channels, is getting six times bigger in the mobile IV2 design. Uh, we are going to introduce that later, but just give you a preview about different trade offs. Okay. So there's no free lunch. Seemingly, we are reducing the number of weights, but we have to pay uh, the, the tax. We have to pay, pay for that by increasing the number of channels. Okay? And increasing the number of channels will lead to a lot of memory movement. Data movement is very expensive. So um, actually, this is very parameter efficient, but not always translate to speed up. Okay, so uh, we're going to talk about pooling layer now. Uh, previously, we talked about a stranded convolution. Another way to um, uh, increase the feature map or some sample the feature map much quickly is by using uh, the pooling. Okay, for example, you can use either max pooling, is five, is the max of these four pixels. We have um, this eight is equal to the largest one out of these four elements. Okay. We can always uh, also do this kind of average pooling, where this four is the average of these four elements. Okay. So that's the uh, pooling operation. So the stride um, is the same size, uh, it, it has the same effect of using a strided convolution, which we just introduced uh, with uh, uh, i c equal to k. Okay. And the good thing is compared with stranded convolution, which actually introduce actual parameters, this, how many parameters does this introduce? Zero, 
have zero parameters. That's the good thing. Introduce zero parameters, but also keep in mind there's always no free lunch. Zero parameters means it's a very few, a little capacity, expressiveness. Okay, so you have to use wisely whether you can use uh, two by two, threaded by two, threaded convolution versus a down sample layer. So that's the beauty of this kind of neural architecture design, which we are going to be introduced um, in the neural architecture search sections. So no learnable parameters, down sample, the feature map into a smaller size. Now let's talk about another important layer, which is the normalization layer. So this one is super important, even for large language model. Uh, this layer norm is very popular. So let's see, what is a normalization layer? Um, we first have to pick a set of regions. It could be this, this region, this region, or this region. After you pick a region, we are going to find the mean of those numbers and also uh, the variance of that number. And why do we need uh, this epsilon? Because we are going to divide by the variance to, uh, uh, to prevent dividing by zero. So we want to make sure uh, we want to uh, send, uh, put the distribution into the, uh, to the to make the mean to be zero and the variance to be one. Okay, so by doing x minus the mean divided by variance, we can get the normalized layer. Okay. So um, uh, how do we uh, pick um, the set? Okay, there are several ways to pick the set where we are going to find which set are we going to pick uh, those, those elements. We can either uh, do batch normalization, which is selecting from the batch dimension uh, plus the height and width dimension, which means for each channel, you are going to have independent uh, mean and independent standard deviation uh, over uh, this region of pixels. And this super popular batch normalization, uh, each channel you have a mean, you have a uh, variance or standard deviation, okay, which can be folded into the previous convolution layer to avoid one extra kernel call. Okay, so very implementation friendly, very popular. And also the layer norm. Okay, what is a layer norm? We are selecting given a specific element. Okay, so different n, we have this one specific element over the channel dimension and H and W dimension. Okay, so layer norm is also quite quite widely used in recent large language models. So before you do the attention about different tokens, okay, different tokens, it just doesn't have this H and W is just one dimension, just have the C dimension. And you wanna make sure you normalize them before you do the attention between each other, which we are going to cover them uh, in the transformer section. Also do the instance uh, normalization. Now we have even fewer number of uh, pixels. So only one channel, only one element, but across the whole H and W dimension. Or the group norm, okay? uh, which is in between the previous methods. Okay? So rather than uh, picking the entire channel here, okay? we are picking a subset of the channels. Okay? It's in between layer norm and also e the e instance normalization. So for those interested in the, some advanced topics, normalization layer, is something we can utilize for efficient uh, purpose, okay? Notice how many parameters that we have. So we have uh, two learnable uh, parameters for each dimension, which is um, the scaling factor and also the bias, okay? So this is just one dimensional um, um, vector, which is relatively parameter efficient. So when we are doing fine tuning, a very cost efficient way is actually just fine tune the scaling factor and also the bias in the batch normalization or in general in the normalization layer, which is one of the efficient parameter, parameter efficient fine tuning techniques. And when we talk about quantization in a later part of this lecture, we are going to introduce smooth quant and calculation and wear weight quantization, um, which can actually fold some of the scaling factors you find to, uh, in quantization, like some of the garbage you find, um, you actually can squeeze and uh, absorb 
uh, those scaling factors into the previous normalization layer. Okay, so actually you saved another parallel call. So those some of the advanced topics you don't understand. That's totally no problem. We are going to revisit uh, this normalization layer in fine tuning lecture and also in the large language models quantization lecture. Actually, this will be useful in uh, the last homework or the fourth, actually the fourth, fourth homework. When we are compressing large language model, we are going to absorb some of the uh, scaling factors into the uh, bias and also the scaling factor uh, for the uh, normalization. Okay? So refer to this slide uh, when you are doing the homework in lab four. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, next one, we have the activation function. Okay? So only after, uh, only if the um, activation is larger than a threshold, then the neural is going to fire. So that's the popular random activation function. And in, all, in order to make it easy to quantize, sometimes people clip it uh, to a number. Six is a popular number. Okay? And in order to have the gradient, uh, uh, also when you are negative, people invented it like leaky value switch and hard switch compared with zero gradient here, uh, this has gradient everywhere. Okay. Um, and also there are other activation functions. So a uh, key uh, um, pitfall here is that um, value function is very hardware friendly and some of the activation functions are super difficult to quantize and not quite hardware friendly. So unless really necessary, uh, sometimes to avoid those hardware unfriendly uh, activation functions. And lastly, uh, transformers, which we have actually a dedicated two lectures to talk about it, but let me give a preview over. Um, so the transformer basically have the um, contact stage and also the uh, generation stage. Okay, so uh, in each transformer block, we have a multi-header tension and two fully uh, connected layers. Okay? So uh, one multi-head attention and one feed forward layer. A feed forward layer is basically a uh, multi-layer uh, multi perception or a fully connected layer. Uh, so the input consists of three parts, the um, QKV, the primary key, and also the value. They both um, pass it through three linear transformations, which is the fully connected layer we introduced in the beginning of the lecture. Um, and then we do the scaled uh, dot product attention. And what is that? Actually Q uh, transpose, um, uh, Q times K transpose uh, through matrix multiplication. And we'll scale it by dividing uh, the dimension. So we want to normalize that, no matter how many dimensions you have, we want to be fair. Um, and then we do a soft max and, and do another max. So basically, this is the key of uh, transformers inside a transformers computing. And we can have multiple heads. Each head uh, learn different features. Uh, we have multiple of them, uh, to, and that's the name multi head attention. Okay, we have three head in this example. In the later part of this lecture, we are also going to introduce other techniques. Uh, like multi query attention uh, and also the group attention. And we just repeat uh, this building block many times uh, so that we can have uh, the whole transformer. All right, with that, uh, let's take a break uh, for five minutes. We're going to come back at 4 20. All right, uh, welcome back. Let's continue the discussion uh, with popular. CN architectures, starting with AlexNet. Um, so some, for, for those who are very familiar with that, uh, we're gonna focus on how to calculate uh, the dimension uh, for uh, these different models. So starting with 224 or 224, and then we can use the equation previously to calculate, uh, we have a stride of four, uh, which covers one to stride of four, we can calculate the dimension for the H and W of the next layer versus the next layer, versus it has um, uh, five convolution layers followed by uh, three linear layers, okay? Uh, two, uh, yeah, three linear layers. And using this equation, you can quickly do the math for the remaining uh, uh, several layers to calculate what is the dimension, okay? 
is really uh, the dimension of the input uh, plus two times um, um, use this basically just use this equation plus two times the padding size minus the kernel size divided by the stride and then you can calculate the dimension for the remaining layer. So for efficient AI research, it's super crucial to understand the dimension for the weight and also for the uh, feature map. Okay, so for example, given a convolution layer, the, uh, the input layer, and the different dimensions of the kernel, like to calculate what is the output channel, what is the output dimension. So that's a very basic knowledge. And later people uh, designed the VGG network, which is using a uh, very um, uh, homogeneous three by three convolution through, throughout the entire layers and followed by three big fully connected layers. So the six layers all together, that's why it's called VGG16. Um, so uh, each of them you can have the batch normalization and answer value. Uh, so this relatively quick play simply is a very basic knowledge. So for resin 50, people introduce this residual branch. Okay, so it has three layers, a one by one layer. Uh, followed by a bottleneck three by three layer, why we call it bottleneck, because the channel is shrink by four times from n to n divided by four. Okay, so before feeding into this three by three column, we shrink it by four. Why do we shrink it? Because three by three convolution is very heavy, right? So we want to reduce the channel size to reduce the computing and reduce the number of parameters. Okay, that's why we do this bottleneck layer to have n by four. Uh, for this three by three column. And finally, we have uh, the last one by one convolution uh, projected back to N. This is when the input dimension matches the output channel size. There's also another scenario where you have a tongue sample or you have a stride of two convolution, making the input and output dimension doesn't match. In this case, in the residual branch, uh, we have this stride by two one by one convolution, which doesn't change um, the number of channels, but the resolution here, we get a half of the resolution. Okay. You can also use this bypass residual branch in case the input and output doesn't share the same number of channels. And then we have this mobile net. So the difference, main difference here is we are actually using a three by three depth wise convolution, which we just introduced which is a special case of group convolution where the number of groups actually equals to the number of channels. Okay? Um, it is very parameter efficient, very computing efficient, but unfortunately, this is the hardest part. It has a big extension ratio, changing your channel number from n to n times six. We call it inverted bottleneck because this is not a bottleneck, but this is actually larger in the middle. So we call it an inverted bottleneck layer. Okay. Um, and the remaining part is very similar, right? one by one column, one by one column, you have a three by three, depth wise in the middle. And then here, when you have a stride of two, the mobile design doesn't have uh, this residual branch, but directly used um, the three by three depth wise column, but uh, the stride equal to two. All right, uh, let's now jump into the efficient ma efficiency metrics. Uh, how should we measure the efficiency of neural networks? Usually there are different aspects cannot be achieved at the same time. Smaller model, faster model, greener model means energy efficient model, but maintaining uh, the accuracy. Okay? So smaller usually corresponds to the storage. How large is your mobile app? How many parameters do we have? So, when you're downloading it from the app store, it won't take a lot of time. Faster, we'll talk about latency and also throughput. And next, we'll do also introduce this um, energy, uh, which is an important aspect to make great AI possible. And key uh, component, including the computing and also the memory. We are going to introduce these metrics, either memory related or computing related. Memory related includes the number of parameters, the model size, the total and peak activation size. Computing related, what is the MAC, what is the flop, what is the flops per second and ops and ops per second. So let's first introduce the latency. This is a low latency, uh, this is high latency, and this is low latency. Right? So latency measures the delay of a specific task. 
right? So for processing each frame, in this case, it requires 638 milliseconds. So that's the latency to process each frame. To process each frame in efficient VIP, only 46 milliseconds. What about throughput? Okay, so this is very low throughput. This is a high throughput. So throughput measures um, the rate at which the data is processed. Okay, so here we can process six videos per second versus this high throughput case, we can process 77 videos per second from the temporal shift logic, which we're going to introduce in the video understanding lecture. Okay. So what's the relationship between latency and throughput? So in this example, um, this is a latency to process each image, recognize who she is, who he is, takes 50 milliseconds. Uh, so the latency to process each image is 50 milliseconds. And we process them one by one. So how many images can we process in each second? A thousand divided by 50. We can process 20 images per second. So that's the throughput. What about in this case? We have more engines in process them, process these images in parallel, but each one is taking longer. Okay. So this design, the latency is 100 milliseconds, but the throughput, you can process um, 40 images per second because you have four such engines. Okay. So the higher throughput uh, translates to lower latency, higher throughput, but higher latency. Right. So that's lower latency translate to higher throughput. So this is um, lower latency, but actually lower throughput. So neither of these translate to each other. So seemingly um, lower latency means faster, lower higher throughput also means faster, but they do not translate to each other. Okay, so that's one of the um, key key thing we have to learn from this lecture. So batching and parallel processing usually helps with increasing the throughput. You just throw more machines, through more GPUs, through more CUDA, CUDA cores, you can increase the throughput, right? But increasing the latency is not easy, okay? Reducing from 100, increasing more CUDA cores by such coarse grained um, uh, parallel processing with outer loop, at the, uh, parallelizing at the outer loop cannot decrease the latency, right? So in, uh, optimizing the latency is really uh, more challenging. Okay. So a good way to uh, so we reduce the latency is by overlapping the compute with the uh, memory access. For example, when we are loading the input, loading the weight, uh, input convolved with the weight and store the output. When do I, we are doing the compute, we can overlay um, the load and uh, the loading the weight, loading the activation of the next layer to overlap them together to hide and reduce the latency. Okay, so data movement and computing can be overlapped. So the latency has two parts: okay? compute part versus the memory part. Okay, um, so the computation equal to the number of operations in a neural network model divided by how many uh, operations can be processed per second. Okay, so this is hardware specific, this is model specific. And the second part, the T memory, okay, also consists of the data movement of activations and also data movement of the weight. And the, the T data movement equal to how many parameters, um, how, how, how large is your model divided by the bandwidth of a processor. Okay, how many megabytes, how many gigabytes of memory access you can have per second. Okay, so this is again hardware specific and this is neural network specific. Um, so are we saying that by putting compute and load loading as doing it at the same time optimizes the latency, but uh, from what I see, um, the, the, the image up there, that's like, so um, execution of two separate exact samples, is that correct? Or it's actually in the same sample, you're just, you know, doing loading like one at a time. Uh, so processing just this one, uh, you're right. So processing this one, uh, 
old. So you can think view in two, two scenarios. Okay? I'm talking about just one single neural network layer. Uh, to process one image, you need the many layers. Yeah. That's why you overlap them together. The total time to process one image is shorter. So you have shorter latency. Okay, so this is also this is just one layer. layer. Okay, not the way, not the input for layer one, this is layer two. You can overlap them together. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I guess you are saying this is image one, image two. So yeah. that doesn't change the latency. Mm -hmm. oh, the loading weight, is that the loading weight from CPU memory to GPU memory? Uh, we didn't talk about that. This is just loading weight from the CPU memory compute on the CPU, for example. You can also think about it as loading from DDR6 or GDR6, the GPU memory, and then to the compute. The load the memory, load weight is very general. You can load from the CPU weight uh, or from the CPU to GPU, depending on where you are processing. Question. The data movement and computation operations have to be performed sequentially, right? Because you need the result before you Data. Right, you have to finish computing before you can store it. So that so then is one of them usually much larger? Why the max rather than the sum? Uh, so the T computing versus the T memory, because if you have longer, um, let me see, um, it can be either compute bounded or either memory bounded. You can have a lot of compute units, but your memory cannot sustain such high computing. You are saturated by the you can be saturated by either of them. That's why we have max. They have to be just like the uh, water barrel, right? The shortest bar depends on how much, uh, determines how much water you can hold. So let's now switch here and talk about the energy efficiency, right? Running on the phone, you don't want your phone to drain the battery. So important concept here is that memory reference is super expensive. This is a log scale, a log scale. It's two orders of magnitude uh, more expensive than doing arithmetic, like do, doing an add or a multiplication. It just take a couple of uh, people draws, but moving the data from memory, from DRAM memory, it's taking 400, uh, 640 uh, people draws to try to avoid memory reference. Memory is expensive, computing is cheap, memory is eating out, draining all the batteries. Okay. So um, let's introduce how to calculate the number of parameters in a neural network. So for a linear layer where we have uh, C in, C out, the number of parameters is just uh, C in times C out, five times three in this case. Uh, for convolution layer, uh, the convolution uh, kernel has four dimensions. Okay, This is kernel size, and whereas kernel size, like three by three, times input channel, times output channel. And what for the what about the group convolution? You have a group of two in this example, and we talk about that. We just divide it by group, divide by G. Like in this case, these two groups do not share, uh, do not have any dependency, and the number of weights are divided by half in that case. And that's why this convolution is the extreme case where G equals to K. Okay, and as a result, we have only three terms. K by k by c okay so that's for the group convolution and using that we can calculate the number of parameters in lx net okay so um for the first layer the kernel size is um 11 by 11 and we have three input channels corresponding to rgb and we have 96 output channels so you multiply them together you get 24,000 uh, parameters and similarly, you can calculate for uh, different layers. So it's here we have group of two. So here we divide it by two when calculating the number of parameters for group convolution. And similarly, you can easily do the math for the remaining layers, okay? Multiplying these four terms. And finally, for the fully connected layer, you just multiply the input channel with the output channel. And you can immediately find which layer is very uh, is consuming a lot of the parameters, the fully connected layer, because each output is connected to each input. That's very redundant. That's why later uh, models get rid of uh, these fully connected layers in CN models. But recently, for transformers, all the layers are fully connected layers to provide enough capacity. So there's never the right and wrong. Right. It's just based on experiment through a lot of GPU hours, train it, try it, 
until you find a good resume. All right, and then we talk about model size. So what's the relationship between the number of parameters and the model size? Okay, so just um, the bit width. How many bit do we need to represent each weight? Right? You can use eight bits. Uh, you can use that's one byte. You can use a P16 as two bytes, or you can use full precision as four bytes. In our homework, we are going to use only four bits, half a byte, to represent each weight. So, for example, you have seven uh, billion parameter model. One billion is 10 to the power of how many? Nine. Okay, that's one billion. And my guy is to the power of six. Okay, kilo is to the power of three. Okay. So seven billion parameter model using four bits, what is the model size? Seven billion, that's seven gigabytes, if it is eight bit, right? And we are using only four bit, that's only three and a half gigabytes. Okay, so you're gonna use, make sure your laptop has at least um, eight gigabytes of memory in order to finish the homework, which I think should be feasible these days in 2023. So key idea is to uh, reduce model size is to reduce the bit width, the precision. Okay? Like Alex had 61 million parameters, um, each using 32 bit, that's four bytes. Okay? Um, so that will be uh, 224 megabytes. Okay? Uh, using eight bit, uh, what is the total storage? Eight bit is just one byte. So 60, 61 million uh, parameter means 61 megabytes. Okay, so that's the way to calculate model size. And next we have uh, the total activation and also the uh, peak activation. Okay, because activation is pretty crucial from ResNet to MobileNet, the number of parameters reduce a lot, but actually the peak activation increased. So that's some of the uh, problem for IoT pro uh, devices we are going to cover later in the lecture. And sometimes the peak activation determines what is your real bottleneck. If one layer is this big, if your memory is only this big, then you can absolutely not fit. Although these later layers can all fit. Okay? So that's the problem of uh, imbalanced activation. The peak activation versus um, what you have. So the peak activation is the real bottleneck. And the main bottleneck for training, uh, for activation, uh, versus the parameters. The parameter reduce a lot uh, from ResNet to MobileNet, but the, the memory bottleneck, which is the peak activation, didn't increase much from MobileNet, uh, from, from ResNet to MobileNet. And usually we have this U-shaped pattern uh, for the activation versus the weight. And why is that the case for CNs? For early layer, we have lots of Wait for activation, activation because early layer we have big resolution, right? and as the resolution gets full, it becomes small. But later stage we have more activate, uh, we have more weights. Why is that? All of them are three by three, imagine. But later stage we have a lot, a lot more channels, okay, making uh, the weight becomes larger. Okay? So we can use this way to calculate. The size of the feature map of each layer, basically HW times the channel, okay, three dimensional. And we can find um, the activation is pretty big in the beginning and gets much smaller in the later part, which echoes with the figure uh, is shown here. So we can also calculate uh, the total activation by summing them up together. And the peak activation is given a specific layer. We go through all of them. Uh, the input activation plus the output activation as a first order approximation as in order to compute this specific layer, how much memory do I need? That is input activation plus output activation and calculate that for the entire, uh, for different layers and finding the max, that's the peak activation size. Okay. Next, let's talk about Mac. So we have heard of Mac so many times. That's not from McDonald, but that represents multiply and accumulate operation. That's one Mac. So A plus B times C, that's one Mac. Okay. Um, for example, 
for matrix y vector multiplication, you have a n by n matrix times n by one vector. Uh, what is the number of max in this operation? So in order to produce each element, okay, uh, you have to multiply these four elements together. And we have eight of them. So this is seven of them, so we have four times seven. Okay, so in general, is n times n plus the number of max uh, to calculate matrix vector multiplication. What about general matrix matrix multiplication? Okay, we have this is um, eight by four and four by two. Okay, and in order to calculate each output element, we have to do a dot product of these four elements, and we have two by eight such elements. The total number of max equal to four by eight by two. Okay, so in general, it's m by n by k. Okay? As we can see, the GMM is uh, more um, uh, has more compute than matrix vector multiplication. Okay, so here we summarize. Uh, the MAC for different layers. Linear layer is just matrix vector multiplication. So the MAC is just C I C O, C in C out. And for convolution, in order to calculate each output pixel, we have to calculate the convolution for this entire uh, KH by KW times C I, C I this amount of uh, uh, max. And totally, uh, we have how many C outs? We have H. H out, W out times C out, this amount of um, pixels to be calculated. So altogether, we need to multiply these six, six terms together. So this is the amount of output pixels. This is the amount of max we have to do per output pixel. Okay? So that's why we have these six terms together. And for group convolution, we mentioned that before, we just divide um, the CI by G since we're saving uh, G times uh, the number of computes. When it comes to depth-wise convolution where G equal to C, we just eliminate this term, it becomes one. So we have five terms here. So that's the way to calculate the MAC for different layers. Uh, for LXNAT, remember we have these six terms. The output dimension is 55 by 55. Um, the kernel size is 11 by 11. Uh, and then we have three input channels and 96 output channels, okay? So similarly, we can do the six term multiplication to calculate the second layer divided by two since this is group convolution. And you can do the similar job for the remaining where for the FC layer, just two terms, C in times C out, that's the number of max. So finally, what is flop and flop? So flop represent number of floating point operations. Okay, so a multiply is the floating point operation. An add is also a floating point operation. Okay? So one mac equal to two flop because a mac consists of a multiplication and the, uh, and the accumulate and the add. Okay, that's why one multiply and accumulate one mac operation is two floating point operations. Okay? Assuming the operands are floating point. For example, AlexNet has 724 million max. What's the total number of flops? So 724 times two, that's 1,448 million flops or 1.4 giga flops. So it's one giga equal to 1,000 mega. So what is floating point operations per second? We have a big letter S in the end. It means how many flops you can calculate for each second. Okay, so this is plural, this is per second. Big letter S means per second. What about all? Because not all the numbers are floating point numbers. You can have integer numbers. You can even have four bit numbers. You can even have half precision numbers, etc. So all is more general than flop. Each operation is considered all. A four bit multiplies an op of four bit uh, add is also an op, so op is more general. Um, so similarly, Alex has 724 million max. The total number of operations is also 1.4 G. Okay? So operation is more general, floating point operation. Operations per second is just 
how many operations in the conflict in each second. Big letter S means per second, small letter S means uh, plural. All right, with that, uh, we can conclude the lecture today. Today's uh, main topic is just talk about um, today's AI is pretty big, large model to achieve high accuracy. And we introduced uh, different techniques, different neural network layers, basics of neural networks, and also popular efficiency metrics of neural networks, uh, the number of parameters, how to calculate the size, the activations, and also introduce the computational cost, the max, flops, ops, et cetera. And hopefully that gives you a clear view of the efficiency metric. Yeah, I just want to observe on the efficiency metric. So uh, as far as I'm saying, flop and op are measures the number of operations, whereas flops and ops is the speed of the hardware. Right, right, correct. So um, not necessary speed, because it's workload dependent. Mm -hmm. For example, running a uh, GPU running the Alex net may have this amount of flops per second, but running mobile net, it may have a lower flops per second because uh, mobile net is, uh, has less parallelism. It's not harder of friendly. So the actual flops per second might be much lower than this theoretical peak performance. So the peak performance is like uh, ignore other uh, basically how many units of multiplication unit you have divided by the time the uh, divided by uh, so that's the that's the peak that's the uh, uh, theoretical uh, achievable thing but usually you have other bottlenecks like memory etc so usually you, you cannot achieve a hundred percent of that all right, it's 4.55, so we'll leave the PyTorch tutorial, uh, put it online, and so hopefully you can check it out. And don't forget to uh, upload it uh, by uh, the deadline. So our TA will put the deadline to put live zero on um, um, our course website, so make sure you submit it on time. It will not be graded, but it will help be helpful for you to learn the basics of PyTorch and also get familiarized how to upload the homework. Yeah. See you on Thursday. <laughs>